In this presentation, I will guide you through one of the full mouth reconstruction cases I completed in the past year. The patient came in with a failing dentition and after the treatment was completed, had fixed full arch restorations. This 75-year-old patient was not satisfied with the way his teeth looked. He also had trouble chewing and speaking. You can note that in the relaxed state he's showing only mandibular anterior teeth. When he smiles, things look slightly better. Due to decreased vertical dimension of the occlusion, we see pronounced wrinkles in the corners of the mouth. There is some canting of the incisal edges to the right side, and the maxillary midline is slightly off. It is tilted to the right as well. This patient invested a significant amount of time and money in his dental health throughout his life. We see some crowns, implant restorations, multiple fillings, and the partial denture. Occlusal contacts are only present between the anterior teeth. Note the supereruption of the mandibular incisors. It becomes very clear when you appreciate the difference in gingival levels. The lower left canine is affected by recurrent carious lesions, and the second premolar is broken at the gingival level. The buccal margin of the porcelain fusto metal crown was patched with an amalgam restoration. On the right side, we can see recurrent caries on the labial margin of the canine crown. Implant restorations on the maxilla are decemented. Gaps between the custom abutments and restorations are obvious to the naked eye. Our patient removes these implant crowns with his partial and puts everything back in by himself. The patient is in class 2 malocclusion. Notice the overjet in the anterior region. The only natural tooth in the maxilla is the premolar on the left side. Everything else was replaced with implant crowns and the removable partial denture. When we remove the prosthesis, we can appreciate the condition of the underlying tissues. Soft tissues appear red and irritated. The patient also admits not removing the denture at night time. There are two locator abutments attached to the anterior implants. As I mentioned previously, the crowns on the right side are no longer cemented to custom abutments. Due to constant irritation, there is some overgrowth of the soft tissues around the locator abutments. The mandibular ridges appear to be of adequate width clinically. There is a good amount of keratinized gingiva. There is a retained root tip on the left side. Due to supereruption of the mandibular anterior teeth, there is some excessive vertical alveolar bone exposed. On periapical radiographs, we can appreciate the implant positions and the state of the natural teeth. There are radiographic signs of periapical lesions, poor marginal integrity of crowns, and signs of carious activity. On the panoramic radiograph, we can evaluate the position of the inferior alveolar nerve relative to the ridge crest. Clinically, all existing maxillary implants were solid, with no mobility and no superation. After a thorough discussion of treatment options, our patient agreed to get all his natural teeth extracted, to get six implants placed in the mandible, to have all superstructures of the existing maxillary implants removed, and to get full arch maxillary maxillary and mandibular fixed complete dentures. At the surgical appointment, I removed all the mandibular teeth and recontoured the bone, mostly by removing excessive bone in the interior region. At that time, five implants were placed. I used the harvested native bone to augment certain areas of the ridge. Due to a significant bony defect in the molar area, the site was grafted and the implant placement was deferred. This is a post-operative panoramic radiograph taken on the day of the surgery. Due to grafting and poor initial stability of some of the implants, cover screws were used and the flaps were sutured over the top. In this case, dense ply astra implants were used. In the maxilla, the patient had four Zimmer implants and two Ankylos implants placed previously. 
The sixth mandibular implant on the lower left side was placed at the uncovering appointment three months after the initial surgery. During all this time, my patient did not have any temporary prosthesis, though he continued using his upper partial denture for look. At subsequent restorative appointments, I had to remove and put back all of the existing maxillary restorations. On this photo, we can see six long open tray impression copings attached to the implants. First, we need to fabricate a custom tray. At this stage, I took the alginate impression of the attached copings using the plastic stock tray. The impression was removed, but all the copings stayed on the implants. Now I will show you how to make a custom tray for this case. I made the maxillary tray in a similar manner. You take a few dowel pins and place them in the alginate impression. Then you pour your impression in stone. After retrieving the cast, the dowel pins stay embedded in stone and they will indicate the positions of the impression coping pins. I used rope wax to block out proper space for the copings and impression material. This is the mandibular custom tray. As you can see, I made six openings for easy access to the impression coping pins. To prevent movement between the impression copings, we need to splint them with rigid material. I used floss to support light cured resin. With a micro brush, you apply your material of choice. You should do it in small increments in order to minimize shrinkage. When you are done, it will look like this. The next step is to eliminate any tension between the copings that was created due to shrinkage of the material. For that purpose, I made cuts in between each and every coping with a high-speed handpiece and a diamond burr. Here is an enlarged view. Note that you don't want to make these cuts too wide. Then I fill the cuts with a new portion of the resin to connect them back together one by one. When all of the copings are connected, we are ready to take the final impression. I inject light-bodied PVS impression material onto the tissues and around the copings, and my assistant fills the custom tray with heavy-bodied PVS material. The impression tray is placed in the mouth. I like using a Brandemark lip retractor at this step. When the impression material sets, I unscrew every impression pin. Sometimes, especially in the posterior aspects of the mouth, it is very difficult to engage a pin with a screwdriver. In these situations, a needle holder is useful for removal of the pins. And this is my final impression. I want to make sure there are no voids around the impression copings or any bubbles on the soft tissues of the ridge. We can dismiss the patient at this point. In the lab, appropriate lab analogs are attached to the impression copings. Vaseline is applied to the impression around the copings to prevent sticking of the soft tissue replicating material. For a soft tissue model, you can use a special material or any type of PVS material available. The impression is properly boxed and poured in dye stone. The maxillary impression is then taken in a similar manner. Now that I have both models, I need to make sure they are accurate, that my models are true representations of the implant's positions in the patient's mouth. In other words, I need to verify the accuracy of the casts. I will show you how to do this using the maxillary cast. First, I retrieve all of the impression copings from the final impressions, attach them to the final casts, and connect them with the resin material. Then, to relieve the tension due to material shrinkage, I make cuts in between the copings. At the next appointment, I attach impression copings with resin to the appropriate implants. This is how it looks in the mouth. Then, I fill the cuts with resin one at a time to splint all the pieces together. When everything is splinted, I unscrew and remove the impression coping pins and retrieve the verification jig in one piece. Then I position my verification jig on the final cast and evaluate its fit. I inspect the intimacy of the fit between implant analogs and impression copings. I don't want to see any gaps between the components. I look at each and every connection. In a similar manner, I verify the mandibular cast as well. So now I have an accurate copy of the maxilla and an accurate copy of the mandible. The next step is to articulate the casts with one another. This stage is identical to an intermaxillary record appointment for a set of complete dentures. 
I put four healing abutments on the maxillary cast and two locator abutments from the patient's mouth. I attached two metal locator housings on the locator abutments and then fabricated a base plate. It is not a necessary step, but it will make my base plate more stable during the subsequent bite registration appointment and the teeth try-in appointment. At the intermaxillary record appointment, we contour wax rims for proper lip support, proper length and proper vertical dimension of occlusion. Teeth are selected and the midline is marked on the rims. Then the bite record is taken in the conventional manner. The case was registered in a centric relation. The casts are then articulated with a face bow and bite record. In the lab, the teeth are arranged according to the prescribed contours of the wax rims. At the next visit, the setup is evaluated intraorally. I check aesthetics, phonetics, midlines, position of the incisal edges, planes of occlusion, and bite record accuracy. I ask for feedback from the patient regarding the setup. After the setup is approved, the case is sent to the lab for the next stage. In the lab, the technicians make some requested modifications, digitally scan the approved setup, and mill two screw-retained complete dentures out of PMMA blanks. These CAT CAM PMMA prostheses are returned for another try-in. These restorations are evaluated in the mouth and can be modified chair side with an acrylic burr. You can also add composite resin to them if needed. On this lateral view you can appreciate the soft tissue adaptation and contours. The class 2 jaw relation is addressed by positioning of the mandibular interior teeth labially. The positions of screw axis openings are evaluated as well. In this case, a screw axis channel for the maxillary right central incisor comes through the incisal edge, which is not acceptable aesthetically. The screw axis channel position of the implant located in the left lateral incisor site is better, but is also somewhat close to the incisal edge. There are several ways to address this. We can either fabricate individual crowns, which are cemented separately onto the prosthesis, or not use the abutment screws in these two sites. We can leave two positive stops in these areas. Another solution is to fabricate two parallel custom abutments for these two implants and have the prosthesis seat on them passively in these two areas. On this picture you see the locations of screw access channels of the mandibular train prosthesis. Please note the position of the interior seat relative to the interior ridge crest. At this stage we can check aesthetics and make some modifications if desired. Any feedback from the patient is highly valuable at this point. It is not a bad idea to get an opinion on aesthetics from the patient's significant other. As I noted previously, there is a screw axis opening through the incisal edge of the maxillary right central incisor. It is very obvious on this photograph. I checked the occlusion to make sure my bite record was accurate. The gingival shade is selected at this stage. We also want to talk to the patient regarding the desired shade of the teeth. After collecting all this information, the case is sent to the lab for fabrication of the definitive prostheses. Lab techs will use our trying prostheses as a template to design the final restorations. These are the definitive restorations. Hybrid ceramic material was chosen in this case as it has good mechanical characteristics and great aesthetics. It can be adjusted chair side if necessary and you can also add composite to it if needed. The alternative solution is to mill a monolithic zirconia framework with porcelain applied in certain areas such as the vestibular surfaces of the interior teeth and gingiva. The framework can also be milled out of chrome cobalt alloy or titanium alloy after which porcelain is applied to the metal in the conventional manner. On the lateral views, soft tissues adaptation can be discerned. Please note the position of the mandibular incisors. The palatal part of the prosthesis can be shaded in pink if desired. Four screw access channels are visible. Two anterior implants were restored with two parallel custom abutments on which the prosthesis was passively sliding. Tissue adaptation can be appreciated in this view. Here we see screw access openings of the definitive mandibular prosthesis. 
This picture is from a different but similar case. Titanium non-engaging implant components are cemented to the prosthesis in the lab with resin cement. It is advantageous to have titanium components of the prosthesis in contact with implant connections. This combination will not lead to excessive wear between the surfaces in contact since both materials have the same mechanical properties. This photo is also from a different but similar case. On it we see how the titanium components are attached to the implant analogs. Now let's see how everything looks in the mouth. Tissue contours of the restorations were modified to allow for proper hygiene with a dental irrigator and super floss. Canine guidance was chosen as the occlusal scheme for this case. This patient doesn't have any natural teeth left, so the benefits of the canine guidance are limited in this particular case. Group function or balanced occlusion schemes are both acceptable in this case. The latter two occlusal schemes may minimize forces in certain areas of the prosthesis, which theoretically can be beneficial. Correct occlusion is verified for the third time during the treatment. Abutment screws are torqued with a torque wrench to appropriate values. Screw access channels are plugged with the PTFE material and sealed with conventional composite resin. In the future, when there is a need to remove the prosthesis for the maintenance or repair, the screws can be readily located and accessed. One disadvantage of the screw retained prosthesis is the necessity to use chairside composite to seal the screw access openings. Composite will stain and deteriorate rate with time and these composite plugs may even fall off. Also we don't want to have any occlusal contacts on these composite islands. Relaxed interior view. About a millimeter of the maxillary incisors is visible. This is how it looks when the patient is laughing. Finally, here I asked the patient to smile as big as he could. The patient was satisfied with the outcome. This case took about six months to complete. Most of the time after the surgical part was just spent waiting for the healing to occur. If you have any questions, please let me know and I will do my best to answer them. One last thing, if you got anything out of this presentation, I'm hoping you will do something for me. Please send the link to someone else. Ask them to review this case. Thank you for your time and your support.